Good evening. Goodbye Forever, Volume 2 by Nakta Munshi. Chapter 22, Part 1. Begin the Begin. Annie Churying looked pleased to see me the next day. How I knew, I cannot say. It was something I sensed. There was no reason she should be displeased or indifferent because we'd had the most pleasant and valuable conversations. So what was I noticing? The question didn't linger long. I felt cheered by her good nature. We talked about the differences and similarities between the Kagyu and Nyingma traditions. I was able to tell her something of the Drukpa Kagyu and the Drigung Kagyu because they were, in some respects, closer to the Nyingma style than the Karma Kagyu school. They, ten they tended to have more Gurkha Changlo practitioners, more Nakpas and Nakmas. It was a great relief to find an ordained person who not only seemed normal, but embodied the good qualities one would expect to find in an ordainee. So what I wanted to ask, Annie Churying began, was about your robes. They're lay tantrika robes, aren't they? Yes and no, they're tantrika robes, but not lay. Sorry, I mean lay as in non-celibate. I made an almost dulcet humming sound. I'm sorry to be pedantic, but lay and non-celibate are not the same. The word lay does not mean non-celibate. I know that Tibetans have latched onto the word lay to mean non-celibate, but that is entirely incorrect. Really? Annie Churying asked, but with real interest. Yes, according to every English dictionary I've consulted, including the American Webster's and also the Duden and the Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française. It means unprofessional or not of the clergy. Now, I can see how layman might apply to me, but how, it can, how can it possibly apply to Kyavje Dujan Rimshe or Dilgo Kientse Rimshe? Dujan Rimshe is the head of the Nyingma tradition and he is non-celibate. The head of an ancient religious tradition cannot be described as a layman. The term lay as an English, German or French word cannot be used. The word in Tibetan that equates to lay is kyawo, which means clothed in grey or clothed in pale homespun. The Gurkha Changlo Day don't wear such colours, so even in Tibetan the word doesn't apply. Kya can mean any sort of woolen colour. It could even be pale brown. Quite. Maybe they got lay from Roman Catholicism. That's quite likely, I mused, because Tibetans do use Catholic ecclesiastic titles like His Holiness his eminence, his serenity and venerable. These titles don't equate with Tibetan titles. The main word in Tibetan is Kyabje, which means Lord of Refuge, or Kyabgon, which means Protector of Refuge. Gyalwa, as in Gyalwa Karmapa. Gyalwa means Victorious One, which equates with Buddha. To get back to lay, I should add that to use lay to mean non-celibate is also derogatory in respect of religions which don't have celibacy, such as Judaism and the Protestant churches. There's also Zen, because not every Roshi is celibate. Chukyam Trumpa Rinpoche's friend Shunju Suzuki was married that's fascinating. I'd never thought of that. So what is a Nakpa then, in terms of vows, I mean? Well, it's a little involved, but 
basically the Gurkha Changrode, the long-haired, white-skirted class. There, the ordination is based within Vajrayana. The monastic ordination is based within Sutra. Right, the Vinaya, but we also practice Vajrayana. Yes, and we also practice Sutrayana. It's just that the ordination vows are based in different yanas. There's no exclusion in terms of practice and both practice Dzogchen. Is there a Dzogchen ordination then? No, because Dzogchen is non-symbolic, non-ritual. So most Lamas who are primarily Dzogchen masters either wear Gurkha Changlo dress or whatever they choose. They sometimes wear lay clothes in Dharma colours or they wear white. This makes sense of a lot of things that were confusing. I'm really glad I asked you about this. Happy to oblige, but there's one more thing I should mention. The so-called married monks. Yes, I've heard that term used and never understood it. That's because it's not actually understandable. But the Nyingma school has them, doesn't it? No, but what it does have, and the Kagyu and Sakyas have them too, is non-celibate Lamas who wear monastic robes and shave their heads. They only take the Gainyen level of vows and Gainyen vows don't include celibacy. So they look like monks, but they're not monks. So why exactly? I have no clear idea. All I can think is that it must come out of the persecution of the Gurkha Changlo day that has existed since the inception of the second spread of Vajrayana. So it might be a way of being an undercover Nakpa, which has simply become accepted and institutionalised. Or maybe it's people who decided not to become monks after starting in that direction. Or maybe it's for some other reason that I just can't imagine. I've heard that tantric vows are much harder to keep than the monastic vows, Annie Chuying commented. Do you find that's true? Well, I've never kept the Vinaya, so I couldn't compare. What I imagine is meant that there are vows of view. Vows of view are more difficult to keep because they involve how you see rather than what you do or don't do. The hair vow is easy for me to keep and also the vow never to disparage women. But some of the others are almost impossible to keep. You have to keep restoring them when they're broken. Some really require you to be a realised being and so, of course, they're broken second by second. Of course, you can't tell me about those vows, but what of relationship? As a Nakpa, you have or can have a consort. I can't imagine what that could be like. Nor can I at the moment. I am in a relationship, but my lady friend is not and will never be a consort. I had hoped that she might become interested in practice, but I obviously haven't inspired her sufficiently in terms of the result of practice. Annie Chuying formed a facial expression at that point. It was easy enough to read. It read, you're being self-deprecating and there's no need for that. All right, I replied to her facial appearance. No, I'm not guilty of self-deprecation. I just feel we're having an honest, genuine conversation and I feel it's important to be real. Annie Chuying's eyes widened. Did you just read my mind? No, I laughed. I read your face. I'm an art student, so I've been trained to look, to see. It's not that difficult. I chanced into the relationship by accident. 
It was happening before I had time to think about whether it was feasible or not. And early on, she seemed rather open and curious about my life. And then within three months, it all changed. Did you just read my mind? No, it's fairly typical of romantic relationship. So there wasn't even guesswork involved. And that's simply what happened to me too many times. That's what made me decide to become a nun. That was also a decision made quickly, but when the opportunity arose, it just seemed so obvious. I didn't want to waste my life playing the relationship game, a game where someone always had to lose. This was not the time or place or circumstance to say, it's a shame for both of us that you never met me. So I didn't. Instead, I wore a studied, placid expression from which I imagined nothing could be read and responded, I can see that this could have been a viable decision for me too, given my current circumstances. So apart from your current circumstances, did you initially choose to become a Nakba because of the possibility of finding a consort? I mean, do you think it has advantages over celibacy? I smiled, almost laughed in some strange, bittersweet way and shook my head. Excuse me for saying this, but this is a most interesting conversation. I wouldn't otherwise get the chance to have a conversation like this. But to answer your question, no, I didn't choose to become a Nakpa because of that possibility. It was more of a poetic choice. And I'd seen photographs of Nakpas. I'd read about Aho Repa in Anagarika Govinda's Way of the White Clouds and seen photographs of him in robes like these that I'm wearing. Then almost the first thing that happened to me in India was meeting a Nakpa. He was Nakpa Yeshe Dorje, and he was wearing exactly what Aho Repa was wearing. So it all went on from there. As to advantages over celibacy, at this point in time, I really think celibacy might actually suit me better. I see. Well, yes, finding someone who would be a real consort seems remote at this point. The chances of making mistakes seem all too likely. A consort would have to be a Vajrayana Buddhist with the same Sawai Lamas. She would have to be a romantic partner who was prepared to live the vows. I described the vows as I described them to the three ladies in Hotwells, but with more technical detail. So you see, I've tried living those vows with someone who didn't, and it didn't work. It has to be equal. Yes, I can see that. So in some ways, it would have been better to have become a monk. But it's a higher calling to be a Nakpa, isn't it? I think there is no higher or lower calling, or higher or lower vows, just higher and lower capacities to make use of those vows. And monastics all practice Vajrayana anyway. I think it admirable that you're so non-partisan in your view. That's a little rare. It's not admirable, I laughed. It's more that I live in dread of being an ape. You see, I find competition, rivalry, enmity, dogmatism and chauvinism unworthy even of lower primates. Annie Churying laughed and replied, Yes, I can't disagree with that. It's not been easy being a nun when I look round and see other nuns and monks behaving, well, just as you've seen here. 
It sometimes seems it would be preferable to be a devoted lay practitioner, to give the word lay its correct meaning. However, there's no choice now, and all in all. Yes, the same applies to me. I've taken the vows and I shall keep them for the rest of my life. I shall have to see what happens when I next go to the Himalayas. You think you might marry a Tibetan? That's not impossible, I suppose. I did have a relationship with a Swiss lady once. It was all rather perfect, but being from different countries didn't work. Well, I should say that it was between the age of 14 and 16. Maybe at my age now it would be entirely different. Still, I'd learn Tibetan and make a cultural shift that kept me out of all kinds of typical Western trouble. And land you up in all kinds of typical Tibetan trouble. There's plenty of that, she laughed. You still don't imagine that Tibet was Shangri-La, do you, or that most Tibetans are one step away from Buddhahood? No, I grinned. I may be naive in many respects, but I'm not the deaf, dumb and blind kid. I can't play a mean pinball either. I can, however, see what's in front of my nose. And of course, I've read quite enough about Tibetan history not to have any romantic illusions. No, I don't have too many illusions about Tibetans, but I have found they're not as complicated or neurotic as many Western people tend to be. Of course, Buddhism is their natural religion, not their hobby. With Western people, you never know whether their Buddhism is real or whether it's fashion. No matter how sincere people think they are, they sometimes come to think differently. It's not the same subject, but huge bell bottoms were once objects of desire and now they're starting to become objects of ridicule. So, all in all, I ran out of steam. Sorry, she apologised. I shouldn't have presumed. Nothing to be sorry about in the slightest. I've met a great many people who have just the illusion you describe. And there's no reason, with my arts approach, that you shouldn't naturally draw such a conclusion. Thank you. You know what Paltrel Rinpoche said? I shook my head. I didn't know. If you've got money, she grinned, you've got money-shaped problems. If you have a house, you've got a house-shaped problem. If you have goats, you've got goat-shaped problems. If you have yaks, you've got yak-shaped problems. There's a man I know who married a Tibetan woman, but she had no interest in Dharma in terms of practice. All she required was a portrait of the Dalai Lama on the wall and a set of offering bowls beneath it to fill every day. Her main interest in marrying a Canadian was to escape the refugee camp and live a life of domestic affluence in Canada. So you would have to be as careful in your choice of partner as you are here. Thank you for the warning. A few moments of comfortable silence passed. Are you going to take the Pakshi Trullo and Mahakala initiations tonight and tomorrow night? She asked. I hope to, but I shall have to inquire what is required. Yes, you have to put your name down in advance at the office. Good luck. We made our farewells and I walked off to the office.